Welcome everyone to the webinar today. This is Brian. I'm super excited to be here. We're not starting here for a few more minutes, right? We want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to join. Um, if you were one of the lucky ones to get a cocktail kit, I recommend unpacking it, going ahead and opening up the bottles. If you need to get some ice <coughs> or a glass, uh, do that. Um, I would also suggest uh, if you don't have a kit and you want to mix along, you know, grab some sweet vermouth, some Campari, if you have those, and a spirit of choice. Obviously, those of you with a kit also need to pick out a, um, a spirit to mix with. Uh, gin and bourbon, if you want to mix along with Bill and I, and you happen to have those handy. If you had have something else, grab it. We'll get started here in just a minute. Great. Bill, we all get to stare at you while we, while we wait. <laughs> this is good. Oh, we're not uh, sharing our screens yet? Come on, guys. Well, no, but that's okay. okay. You are. And, you know, given your camera setup, I think it might be a little more complex for you anyway. Why don't I, un I'll start going on video just so you don't feel lonely. Okay. I'm with you guys, too. People can see some All right, there's here Alex. All right, the so we're just going to, we're just, for those of you joining, again, we're going to get started with the webinar here in a few more minutes. Um, you know, Hold tight. We just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to join who's going to mix with us today. Excellent. Meanwhile, we can kind of like... <laughs> Vibe to the music. <laughs> and for your uh, skills here, you can uh, grab some, some gin, some bourbon or mezcal uh, to mix for the drink, and uh, we'll get into it in just a few minutes. Alex, you get to you get to be the one. You're the judge, so you get to be the one that decides. Just start dancing when we're ready. So you know, this is I, a moment yeah. in the show where, like, we're not sure who is going on to the next round. You know, this could be the British mixology drink off. I don't know. I like it. I like it. <laughs> That's actually the one show that my wife watches that on a re reasonably regular basis that I will actually sit down and watch with her. Is the what, what's the show? The British Bake Off. Oh, the British Bake Off. I will nice. say as people, are, as people are shuffling in here, it's nice to see some friendly faces uh, here in the attendee list. Indeed. I'm looking forward yeah. to having everybody on. There's actually a cocktail Bake Off show on Netflix if uh, folks haven't seen, I highly recommend. I think there's about eight episodes. Netflix? Yep, it's really good. Nice. Well, that music felt like a lull. It did. It's <laughs> kind of like, a, this is kind of like advanced hold music, you know? Yeah. This is like hold music when you're on hold with like somebody cool that you want to talk to. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Well, we got a good uh, a good quorum here, but let's give it sixty more seconds. Good. Okay. Once again, just to repeat, or Bill, were you going to say that? No, I just uh, again for folks that are just joining, uh, go ahead and if you've got a kit, open it up, pull out some of the ingre ingredients, open up the bottles. Uh, we'll move quick and introduce it. Um, if you what we didn't send you is any citrus, so grab an orange if you can. Grab some ice. Uh, I'll take you through some other things, something to mix with, and uh, and a spirit. If you didn't get a kit, uh, grab some Campari, some vermouth, maybe a spirit of your choice, and uh, we'll include you. <clears throat> and um, Bill's going to be making a Negroni here in a bit, so grab gin if you want to make a Negroni. Um, I'm going to be making a Boulevardier. Grab some bourbon if you want to mix along with me. Rye in a pinch can work too. Um, and then uh, if you just want to do something low ABV, also soda water or, or sparkling water, good mineral water can make something low ABV in Americano. We're going to talk all about this later, just kind of framing things. And as Bill said, get your kits opened up, bottles open, get some ice, a glass, something to strain with, you know, a spoon or this or that. 
or of course a nice Hawthorne strainer if you happen to have one handy. We'll get mixed in here in just a moment. We've uh, we've got a, a great group. Let's get started, everyone. All right. So, awesome. Uh, yeah. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I know uh, we've got a we've got a lot of mixing and conversing to do. So without further ado, um, let's get into it. Um, if you're uh, if you're not sure what to expect, you are not alone. <laughs> it, is <my> <laughs> it is. It is. It is. You got the signature Brian Walker laugh on the line here. So. Um, <laughs> It's my pleasure to introduce the Cocktails and Commerce guys, Bill and Brian, over to you. Okay, I thought you were going to say so, a little something about uh, ITG, but you know we can get right into I, the cocktails I, if you'd rather. No, you know what? Let's let's do that as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so guys, this 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 talk, Cocktails and Commerce uh, today is brought to you by ITG Commerce. So for. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, uh, we are uh, we're a commerce platform implementation partner. This is how we love to introduce ourselves. We're we're commerce problem solvers. We've been in this business for over a decade. We've done over a hundred successful commerce projects. A lot of our history comes out of the Magento and Adobe space. We've got a growing shopware practice and lots of certifications on both of those fronts. And uh, yeah, just excited to be here today to. To kind of you know start talking about a, new, a newer topic that uh, is near and dear to our heart and that's composable commerce so with that I'll, I'll give it over to Brian and Bill. Wonderful thank you so much Alex and <clears throat> thank you so much for having us uh, Alex and ITG it's uh, it's wonderful to be here thank you for the support <clears throat> and the trust we'll see if that's warranted at the end of this webinar but we very much appreciated it. Speaking of new, uh, Cocktails and Commerce is, is relatively new. Uh, it's something that Bill and I uh, have started doing in, well, I guess we kind of officially launched it in, in uh, was that September, Bill? Something like that. Yeah, maybe August, kind actually. Of, my, my kind of losing track, but we started working on this a, a bit ago. Uh, after each of us left our respective leadership roles, Bill leading uh, commerce uh, technology sales at, at Adobe, uh, focused on, on the enterprise market. Bill also comes with a tremendous CV um, in sales leadership and sales, sales execution, sales process, <clears throat> with really a lens on, on go-to-market uh, strategy um, and how to leverage all the different components to make it work. And that's really where Bill and I kind of intersected professionally uh, we've known each other for a very long time. Uh, myself, longtime e-com person. Many of you know me. I won't go through the CV. But uh, Bill and I connected many years ago on mixology. And so we're blending our love of mixology. We're both enthusiasts. We both learned a lot from each other. Oh, I'm sorry, Holly. If you wouldn't mind, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. <laughs> Holly's, <laughs> Holly's nudging me along. Um, thank you, Holly, for all your support on the back end, by the way. Um, we also have started publishing a free newsletter. Please click the QR code and subscribe. I happen to know many of you are subscribers. Perhaps you found our, your way to our webinar today uh, via the newsletter. Thank you for being here and thank you for your your uh, your support as well. If you're not a subscriber to the newsletter, we'd love to have you um, if you're enjoying what we're up to today. Um, Bill and I also run a small strategic advisory firm called Strategy M. If you're in the commerce tech or services space, you know we'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Holly. Let's move on. Um, today, um, let's move into the drinks. That's why you're all here. Let's be honest. I'll be talking a little bit later about <laughs> composability uh, in commerce. And it's not really um, you know, a surprise that when we, we, when we sort of we're talking about uh, composable commerce and what we might do from a content <clears throat> perspective, it led Bill and I to the Negroni, the Boulevardier, and the long kind of history and heritage uh, around Negronis and Negroni variations, which are in fact a variation of another cocktail, which we'll get into here in a little bit. And well, I guess that is actually on the drink card and that's the Americano. So we'll be talking about these different drinks. As I mentioned earlier, Bill will be mixing the Negroni. I'll be doing the Boulevardier. And if you're mixing with something else, we'd love to kind of help guide you through some of that as well. Um, those of you with a kit, um, you know, that's what's on the left-hand side here. That's what you were you were sent. If you don't have a kit, grab some things like these things. If you have other kinds of bitters, Campari, et cetera. Um, with that, Bill, why don't you kind of walk through the kit, what people got and, and how to kind of get set up? Sure. Um, before that, let me just mention that our idea for this mixing section is not just to 
pour some liquor and mix a cocktail, but really try to impart some knowledge and, and maybe teach you a little something. Uh, if you've been hanging around us for a long time, these seem like pretty simple drinks, but the history as well as what you can do with the different ingredients that you actually got in the kit is really what's more interesting in some in, in some ways. So you should have at least uh, some Campari, the star of the show, some uh, Sweet Vermouth, which is uh, one of my favorite brands, Carpano Antica, some orange bitters, and even some club soda for the Americano option. And then the drink card explains the specs for these drinks, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, I think it's good to take a second and talk about the tools. Uh, this is a drink that's actually gonna be stirred, not shaken. And you don't need a fancy vessel like this. Uh, you could use an old beaker. Um, if you've got a I got some other shaker. examples that might work here, right? For spoons, right? Anything right. like that. If you don't thing. have a strainer, yeah. Yep. So Hawthorne strainer, uh, some kind of a measuring um, goblet, what have you. I really uh, love to, these little. To, I really love these little OXO measuring cups yeah. for mixology. That's my, work, these that's are my awesome. workhorse. Yeah. So one one quick thing, I'm going to make a Negroni. And again, which is with gin, and I'll talk about that in a second. But one quick thing on the on the card, which really gives you the spec. When I make a Negroni, I typically make it as equal parts of all three ingredients. And um, and in this case, though, just for clarification, 50 mils is not an ounce. It's actually an ounce and a half. And so when we make these, if you want to pour the whole thing in, then we need to marry that with a, an ounce and a half of gin. And, yep. uh, and, and the other thing, just to mention that in general about bitters. So in your kit, you should have got a, uh, some orange bitters and bitters are, think of bitters like, like salt and pepper, like seasoning. I mean, you don't have to have them when you order this in a bar, they may not add anything to it, but orange bitters and, uh, aromatic bitters are the two workhorses from bitters. If you look at my bar, I probably have 30 different kinds of bitters. You can add umami, various flavors that really enhance things. One of the things that I think is really cool about bitters that maybe isn't an obvious thing, if you were mixing together a lot of different ingredients, the bitters actually pull and integrate the, uh, the flavors together. So it's really powerful to, to leverage them. And don't be afraid. Just throw them in uh, and it'll <clears throat> enhance your drink. And the more, you, even if you're just starting with, with very simple cocktails like an old fashioned, obviously the bitters is a huge piece of how you want to steer the cocktail in the direction you want to go. So if you're making an old fashioned, for example, you know, you might go with a classic bitter or you might do something like, you know, a, um, a cardamom bitter and you're going to send your old fashioned in a really interesting direction. So as Bill said, it's a really great flavor enhancer. The orange bitters here, you know, the Campari itself is an orange bitter. So you're kind of like doubling down a little bit. So I'd say, in my opinion, you don't necessarily need to use the orange bitters. Keep them, by the way. Throw them in the throw them in in with your uh, your uh, your other uh, mixology stuff, your other cocktail stuff. Um, use it at some point in time. But if you do want to use it, it'll just bump up that that citrus orange kind of note uh, even a little higher than the than the core cocktail. If you're making the Boulevardier with me, you actually definitely want to use it. So it's nice that we have it because I'll be using orange bitters in my Boulevardier. And for those of you who like to do something I call an advanced maneuver, consider mole bitters. Brian and I have a joke that we call that cheating. It is. It's cheating. You, you use this in any drink and it makes it better. So I highly yeah. recommend so mole bitters. It, it totally works. It totally works. I'll say use it. Um, if you're talking to somebody who really knows a lot about cocktails, though, maybe don't mention that you put out mole bitter in there first off, because, you know, I might think you're cheating a little bit. <laughs> and, and don't bring up Aperol. All right. So ounce and, Aperol. Half, <laughs> ounce and a half of gin. Uh, one quick note is just uh, another advanced maneuver. I think um, if you've mixed, I don't know if you've heard this, but I think as you start mixing a lot of ingredients, it's really good to, um, start with the cheapest ingredients. You don't want to be in a position where if you're mixing with cognac, you start with cognac and you mix the wrong ingredient and you have to pour everything out. So uh, the last thing you put in is the most expensive ingredient. So in this case, uh, it's the gin. And so now I have these three things uh, mixed in and uh, now we'll add the ice. So 
this is a, an interesting part to explain a few things to people. I think, you know, how much ice do you put in? Uh, I think a lot of times people just put like a little bit of ice. Personally, I think uh, it's better to put a significant amount of ice. It's going to melt down. Why are we doing this? In this cocktail, we're stirring the, um, the cocktail. It has a lot more ice. When you stir it, it's actually going to melt down. And our goal isn't just to uh, chill the, uh, the, the drink, but it's actually to get dilution. So I, I like to tell people, like, if you think about a martini, some people like, like gin martinis, very dry, which is basically like just gin. If you keep the gin in the freezer and you pour it in a glass, isn't that the same? No, because it's not uh, diluted. So generally, this process of stirring probably adds about 20% volume on okay. the- Okay, uh, Bill, Bill, yeah. sorry. sorry to interrupt you. I want to take a step back here a little bit. I haven't even gotten to the bourbon in mind because I think we went a little quick there. So I just want to recap. For the Boulevardier, ounce of Campari, ounce of vermouth, ounce and a half of the um, bourbon or rye if you have it. And I'm using two dashes. Dashes are kind of like long, long drops is the way I would say. Not like a single drop, but kind of a long drop. Um, okay, now I'm ready to add ice as well. Like we've also forgot to tell you to chill your glass earlier. That's that's my bad. We should always should have had you throw some ice in your glass. In this case, a little late. So I'm going to go ahead and also stir. One thing I'd add too is the spoon. Often you're going to want to think, oh, I should put that in the beaker and stir. On a cocktail spoon, this little end here, which you think might just be ornamental. Actually, this is perfect for stirring in a beaker. This is perfect, of course, for measuring. You'll see bar spoons. Also can be used to stir clearly. This is actually, in some ways, though, an ideal end to stir with. I know that sounds kind of geeky, but we're here to share some lessons learned. All right, Bill, sorry. Pick it up from there. No, no worries. Um, so back to your point. So on my side, I didn't actually put ice in a glass. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, oh, keeping gosh. glasses in You're the not going to do this whole thing about your... <laughs> oh, come on. Why not? Thing, I think it's you? pretty Jesus. interesting. So I don't keep my glasses in the freezer because I actually have a glass freezer on my countertop that I can use the CAT to freeze my glass. You're just showing off, Bill. <laughs> yeah, you're just jealous. So... Uh, <laughs> The CO2 tank under the bar, freeze your glass or keep it in the freezer. Or as Brian said, if when you start mixing, just add some ice ahead of time, maybe even put a little water in it or just a little bit of ice. You'll see bartenders do that, but it's nice to have a cold glass for it is. Uh, a I, lot of I am things. still I am still stuck putting ice in my glass. It's fine. It's fine. And I often, you know, will use that also to to add to my mixing pitcher or my shaker once I'm ready to shake or mix. Um but you do want a cold glass, ideally. In this case, maybe not. Um, and then I we moving on to the. So I've strained. Have you strained, Bill? Yep, I'm all okay. set. So uh, we should garnish. garnish. You want to walk us, walk us through that? So uh, again, it's good to have yourself a, a good peeler. This is a Y peeler. It's a six seven dollar device. I think Brian's got a little bit fancier one. Unfortunately, I just have a thin skin orange. This is a Valencia orange. I think it's better if you get uh, more of a Florida style with a thicker uh, skin. But you want to get a, a pretty big piece of the skin. And the whole idea here is to add some aroma and aromatics. And so you want to basically almost fold it in half and pinch it. And if you look, you'll see that it's actually spraying some... Um, some of the zest, not zest, but basically the moisture on the glass and you can wrap it around the, uh, the rim or on the stem of the glass. And when you take a sip, it will actually uh, enhance the flavor. So cheers, everyone. If you've mixed with us, cheers. If you haven't mixed with us, I hope you can raise a glass of something. Alex, you must have something there. Oh. All right. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm I'm in, I'm in Utah right now. <laughs> it's dry. So for those on right. the West Coast in Pacific time, yes, this is kind of like day drinking. Giant Brian and I are not usually doing this, but we're taking well, one for the team. We happen to have some experience with this, unfortunately. No, I'm teasing. Um, if you're happy hour somewhere, cheers. Um, cheers. 
And, uh, you know, hope you hope you enjoyed walking through that. Um, as I get into the history, I actually think it's, a, it's relevant to kind of even reflect back on the green card. I mentioned earlier that if you want to do a, something low ABV and a historical cocktail, um, what I would do is, frankly, just fill a glass, like a tall Collins-style glass, something like this. Um, fill it with ice. Dump your Campari and your vermouth in. You don't have to use all of it. You know, this is kind of to taste. I might do half this little bottle. So maybe, you know, that's three quarters of an ounce of each. And then top with a mineral water or soda water. When you do so, I highly recommend getting back to your bar spoon. You drop it straight down on the glass. I don't know that you're going to be able to see me do this. And I'm not doing it for real. You put that there and you pour your soda water or mineral water down the stem of the spoon when you make a drink like an Americano. The Americano, as I mentioned, is really kind of the, the origin of the Negroni and the Boulevardier. Um, that is a long time traditional cocktail invented in like the 1860s um, in Italy. Um, and it really didn't have to do with the Americano coffee being called Americanos because the Americans in Italy wanted their espressos watered down. Completely different kind of kind of thing going on. But the Americano cocktail was a very, as I said, long-standing vermouth cocktail that, that added or Italian bitters. And of course, those Italian bitters really came to become Campari in most people's minds. Now that leads us to the Negroni. So we know that the Negroni was invented somewhere between World War I and 1920. October 1920. We know it was October 1920 because that's when it was written in a letter uh, dated October 20th or something, 1920. And in the letter, it talked about a Count Negroni inventing this drink at this bar, Cafe Cassoni in Florence. That picture is from around 1919. So it could very well have looked just like that when Count Negroni walked in. You can see what that corner looks like in Florence today on the right-hand side. Now, now, there actually was not a Count Negroni. Uh, descendants of, um, of the Negronis actually did a bunch of research on this in the 1980s and decided there really wasn't a Count Negroni at that time, but that it was Pascal Olivier de Negroni de Cardi, who was the son of a Count. So he might have called himself a Count, <laughs> but he wasn't necessarily <laughs> himself a Count. But nonetheless... Uh, he went into that bar and he started asking uh, the bartender, Fosco Scarrelli, at the Cafe Cassoni to spike his Americanos with gin. So he wanted, instead of the water added, he wanted gin added. That was his drink. And he became, of course, a regular. And the drink caught on at the bar. And pretty soon, by the 1920s and 1930s in Paris especially, but also elsewhere, the drink had caught on to the point where in uh, in France and in Paris, it became basically the drink everyone was drinking was the Negroni. And it got to the point where American humorist, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I get her name correct, Nina Wilcox Putnam, the American humorist <clears throat> living in, in Paris and all that, you know, all that was going on in Paris, she, um, she said, all of Paris and all of Gaul um, is divided into three parts. One part Campari, one part sweet vermouth, one part gin. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, awesome. so at any rate, um, from then on, right, they, it really became, as I said, a very popular cocktail throughout Europe and Britain and even into the United States. But when World War II happened, and of course, uh, Mussolini and fascism and so on, all things Italian, kind of fell out of favor, Negroni kind of did as well. And so throughout the war, um, you know, Negroni's kind of disappeared from, you know, America, from Britain, from the rest of Europe and so on, and really kind of retrenched back to Florence. After the war, though, um, it actually, again, kind of had a resurgence and within Italy became really the drink called, uh, associated with the Dopo Guero, the after war. And then the Dolce Vita, right? The Renaissance, modern Renaissance, the industrial miracle uh, that happened in Italy when Italy became this tremendous growth economy and very fashionable. 
you know, very sophisticated in the American eye. Think of the movies like Roman Holiday and all those kinds of things, right? The Vespa, all of that, right? Kind of led at the Italian um, fashion and Italian way of life and, and, and joie de vie kind of to the forefront of sophistication again. And the Negroni was carried into modern mixology on the backs, right? Of La Dolce Vita and became really synonymous with more sophistication. Now, there's one thing that's kind of funny in my research about Count Negroni that I kind of skipped over that I just want to mention. He was pretty well-traveled. He actually spent quite a lot of time in the United States, in America, including working as a cowboy, which is surprising. Um, and he was also a gambler and a fencing instructor. So cheers to that. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of history as you sip along. The Boulevardier, of course, is a variation on Negroni, very clearly substituting the bourbon for the um, for the gin. Has become a iconic, very well known cocktail in and of itself. Happens to be one of my faves. Um, and then, of course, there's <coughs> countless variations now of the Negroni and of the Boulevardier and so forth. Um, as this becomes a, a great way for for um, for you to play with a very basic template and explore and have fun. I think we, uh, we're picking up on the, uh, the composability metaphor here. Uh, exactly. But, uh, would, would love, <laughs> love your thoughts on that, Brian. <laughs> um, well, actually I, I'd love to have Bill kind of share his thoughts and maybe I'll chime in from there. I mean, I know we, we share <laughs> a point of view on the relationship, like the nature, the composable nature of the cocktail, and then we'll jump into the core content. We'll pay some bills. Uh, right. Sure. Well, <laughs> I mean, composability is, is, you know, broadly discussed these days around commerce. And in particular, my last four years at uh, Adobe, thinking about it in the context of Magento, there's, there's certainly a lot to talk, lot to talk about. From my perspective, like making the analogy back to cocktails, I mean, cocktails are really, uh, um, you know, a uh, a, a variety of different uh, ingredients that you can mix together to make different kinds of drinks. And that was sort of the intention behind the kit we put together for folks. And sorry if you didn't have a kit, but uh, maybe you get the idea that with a small number of ingredients, you can create uh, a lot of different uh, drinks and flavors uh, just by substituting and um, plugging something in in a modular fashion. So that's sort of the, the connection. And uh, we're going to talk a lot more about composability. But, you know, the, the key areas that that I've seen over the years that people talk about from a uh, modular perspective in terms of key business functionality are things like catalog, uh, product content, uh, merchandising and search, order management, things like that, that... Um, early days came with the platform. And as people have moved to more sophisticated user experience, they're looking for more uh, sophisticated approaches in each of those areas. So composability gives you the flexibility to then start looking at ways of leveraging best of breed in those areas. Yeah. Um, thank you, Bill. Great intro. I was actually wanting you to talk about the composability of the cocktails. But, you know, that was perfect. I did, but I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> now, often I think, you know, today we're talking about Magento. And I think often, um, you know, composability is uh, kind of put in relationship with the so-called legacy platforms. Yes, there are contemporary platforms also, you know, more recently developed platforms, I should say. Also, um, you know, leveraging this conceptually. But I think it's worthwhile, you know, talking about really, you know, what does composability mean? for Magento and frankly, for other legacy platforms. Let's move on, um, Holly, if you don't mind to, to the next uh, slide. Um, you know, I had, an, I had fun putting this slide together. I won't lie. Obviously that's a, that's a screen grab from a, a, a great legendary mu movie, um, Usual Suspects. Uh, I did have fun with, with kind of trying to find a little bit of an analogy and somehow I stumbled on, on this idea. Um, I was kind of intentional. I will admit, I couldn't help myself with the names I associated with each character. You know, 
you know, you got ATG there thinking they're all cool. Those of you from the ATG days, you know what I'm talking about. Hybris, a little bit goth, right? Salesforce, definitely off a bender. WebSphere looks like they came out of a very, very long meeting. <laughs> and Magento. I don't know what Kevin Spacey's doing with his hands. Just saying. I know. I know he was acquitted. And I know that was a terrible joke, but I couldn't help myself. Um, no, seriously. So each of these platforms, you know, are often tagged with the term legacy. They all have a, a few things in common. They all have large install bases. Um, what does that really mean? It means that they are, have to be naturally responsive to all of the various customers they've already acquired on the platform and all the various needs and requirements those customers are going to put on the product management uh, you know, a uh, team and their and their roadmaps, of course, and how the engineering team has to respond, even to um, you know some relatively urgent uh, needs or high integrity commits that some of those customers may have been committed to. That's of course an issue for for almost everyone. But nonetheless, these were all uh, platforms with with large install bases, um, some in the thousands, uh, some obviously much less today. Um, there were you know platforms that we could also have included. Uh, but they obviously weren't, weren't uh, there wasn't room in the lineup and they may already be in prison. <laughs> Blue Martini. Anyway, um, all these platforms were built in a different era. They, um, you know, they had to incorporate a lot of different capabilities many of you are familiar with in order to really satisfy, um, you know, uh, and support the burgeoning and growing e-commerce businesses of their clients back in the day. That would include app servers, web servers, you know, lots of different uh, software and ways to manage incoming traffic and the serving of the application and, and ultimately the, the web experience to the customer, um, which meant, you know, we have to take um, a moment just to acknowledge what that meant for ATG, Web for Commerce, Intershop, kind of the heritage behind Salesforce um, in many ways and Demandware, uh, and Magento had to solve for a lot back in the day when they were developed in the sort of mid nineties to mid two thousands where a lot of this core uh, uh, applications were developed. Many of these platforms today have evolved considerably, but there's still going to be pieces of them that date back of course, to that, to that era. And of course, in all cases, these were also solutions that were acquired um, or transitioned also ownership in some cases, multiple times. What does that mean? It means that, um, you know, they then naturally, focus on selling into the install bases of those parent companies. And that's a big part of the thesis behind the acquisition. And they naturally pivot. It's a very successful strategy for large acquirers. Um, and in most cases, I'd say it was probably a success uh, kind of across the board. But nonetheless, that really pivots and takes attention away. And of course, naturally prioritizes integration with other applications and capabilities the parent company sells uh, versus maybe keeping up with, you know, the, the needs and requirements of a new market or how their customers um, are evolving. It may naturally make them pay attention to other priorities. <clears throat> and so I think it's worth saying that whether you're on Magento or another of these platforms, you're kind of stuck in some semblance um, of what I just described within the company that uh, that that uh, that uh, you know supports and develops the, the software and obviously now that company is probably a division of a much larger organization yeah one other factor holly we can we can move on to the next slide thank you um one other factor just sort of to recognize is that commerce platform replacement cycles have lengthened if you're um, if you're running an e-commerce business chances are you find yourself um, on a platform that you've been on for some time, you're not alone, and there's good reasons for that. But the reality is that, you know, uh, where whereas the replacement cycle when I got involved really in the commerce platform uh, market, um, you know, this was, you know, circa 2006, 2007, 2008, around that time frame, um, you start to see that that, um, you know, the replacement cycle was four to five years. That meant from a vendor perspective that 20% to 25% of the market was turning over. Uh, if you're running an e-commerce business, you were starting to um, 
to recognize the, the effort and the complexity and what can go wrong, because you've probably been with a few, uh, you know, large platform replacement projects uh, in your, in your, in your time, if you've, if you were active back then. And, and the reason why these replacement cycles have really lengthened is of course, the size of the businesses that these platforms support has grown significantly. The, um, the complexity within that business, but also the risk to make significant changes has also uh, increased dramatically. Now, this is no longer 5 to 10% of the parent company that if you're a retailer, for example, an omni-channel retailer, I, I guess I should be more specific. You know, it may have been 5% of the business uh, back when replacement cycles were rapid. Now it may be 40, 50% or even more. Uh, of the business, especially when you factor in how much demand the web is driving besides just what you're transacting directly with online. So now that replacement cycle has lengthened. The, the amount of money you've invested in integrations, of course, is very significant, and you don't really want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, although that's a horrible analogy, clearly. Um, it, it certainly is not something you want to necessarily have to reinvest in if you don't have to. And it may be working uh, to to to, uh, to to a large degree. You may have parts of your organization who are frustrated, but it largely works. Brian, I think those are great reasons, and I and especially when you think about how large these businesses have grown, mm -hmm. you know, the risk to try to replatform is just too much. So it seems to me that the rise of composability now gives people another option from just replatforming to looking at really specific areas perhaps to gain a return or to improve their business metrics. Uh, do you think the maturation of those capabilities has affected this as well? Well, hundred percent. And I think we're, we're clearly in an era today where, you know, point solutions and best of breed have, have really, um, become much more mature, and there's a wide range of different options and, and that are available now, depending on the capability area you're looking at. So yeah, the maturation of those different point solutions has had a big factor, and it's also related to the lengthening replacement cycles because it drive there's there is need there is there is a requirement to continue to innovate um, and to drive you know agility into the business and solve for very specific things, and we'll get into that. Uh, maybe a little bit more, Bill. I want to get your point of view on that here in a minute. But I think we should move on. Let's move on to the next slide. And let's talk a little bit about what composability is. Um, I think it, it is useful um, to use uh, analogies here um, just from a conceptual perspective. Many of you may be very familiar with the concept of composability uh, within, within the commerce industry and the term composable commerce. I like to use the home metaphor in, in many ways though. We live now in a modern era where we have so much standardization that has occurred, uh, whether that's you know both due to the manufacturing um, uh, of the different products and kind of the standardization around it, but also due to regulations and best practices of how a home should be built. Now, when you move into a home, right? If you buy a home, you move in there, there's a lot you can do obviously with wallpaper, with paint, um, with interior decoration um, overall. And you may be able to make that home your own. And that's, of course, content and things like that you may do within an e-commerce business to make that brand saying, and you can do a number of different things. But there is going to come a time, if you're in that home long enough, where you may really want to do some significant remodeling. Maybe you want to, you know, add a at a at a bar like Bill did, which is beautiful and very well done, <laughs> but required expensive. some wall and expensive. It required um, it required um, the uh, the the um, the the you know the moving of walls um, and more significant um, uh, more significant uh, remodeling activity in order to support uh, incorporating that. And you understand the concept today. You can you know, buy off the shelf and reconfigure things, leveraging much more standardization than ever before. Now, in an e-commerce platform analogy, right, that house is your e-commerce platform. And in the past, right, when you bought that e-commerce platform, it may come with everything you think you're going to need to re run your e-commerce business. And it may have been okay, right, for quite a long time. In fact, it may still be largely okay. But there is a need and an opportunity, perhaps, to 
right? Remodel um, and add new components and capabilities, new rooms and so forth. That may or may not come from a single source. It may be requiring multiple different pieces to come together in order to support that. The promise of composability is really around making that easier. It's making the platforms more open and easier to integrate with third-party applications and point solutions. It's enabling headless and different interfaces on top of the platform. And it's making the platform easier to integrate with other third-party applications, including the backend applications like ERP and order management and product information management and a whole host of other things. Now that's the promise. Um, and it's certainly, um, you know, a really valuable direction as we recognize that we may be living in these houses a lot longer than we used to. And that's certainly true in America, even today, not to, not to get into the real estate market and what's going on due to a whole host of different factors in the macroeconomic environment. But when we think about e-commerce, in many ways, it's analogous. And the promise of composability is really to make that much easier more efficient, and of course, increase your agility. I don't want to say quicker, because I'm not sure that quicker is really the right way to think about it, although many will use it um, in how they describe um, the benefits of composability. Um, I think I would be careful there, but certainly agility and flexibility, and not just for today, but obviously, as the user experience and the customer experience continues to evolve, um, and new experiences may come into four or new capabilities may become important, or you just need to upgrade uh, capabilities as your business matures and grows, it's obviously valuable to have a platform that supports that. And I think for the legacy platforms, it's really critical uh, for their existing customers and certainly for, for, the, for their needs today and in the market, as well as for their own core businesses to really lean in and invest that way. Now, Sometimes we get the question, is what I just described the same as mock or not? This is, of course, somewhat of a religious argument uh, that happens in the industry. You can move on to the next slide if you don't mind, Holly, although it's really just that question I just asked. But nonetheless, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, you know, composability, as I said, is really about the pulling apart of the core application, uh, making the bathroom attached to the living room in a more flexible and easy way or the plumbing or the electrical systems that are happening right within the house, not to abuse the analogies, but it's to, to enable you to you know, swap out larger parts of the monolithic application as it starts to become more a different set of different parts that you can plug some different pieces into, but also integrate third-party solutions within the experience without necessarily replacing large pieces of your solution. But in many ways, you're, you're leveraging kind of an evolutionary concept from the days of the monolithic legacy applications into um, the more modern composable framework. And in my mind, it's not mutually exclusive. In other words, a single tenant legacy application can be composable, even if it's not mock. So therefore, they're not the same thing. Now, what makes it a little bit confusing is that many of the vendor community and so on, whether they're in the Alliance or they're a mock-like solution, naturally may be a player within the composable landscape and serve many customers who are operating on Magento or Hybris and so on and so on, Salesforce, of course. Um, and they may be a mock solution that also supports, um, of course, this composable evolution uh, that we're seeing in the market. So I think it's, they are very related terms, often commingled, but they're not really the same thing. All right, let's move on to the next slide. And, and Bill, here, I'd love for you to spend some time. You're obviously very close to this. Um, could you talk a little bit about Adobe? Sure. Commerce and Magento. Yep. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that intro. I, I find myself, uh, it's such a big topic to kind of compare composability and talk about mock and where it fits in. I mean, at the end of the day, these platforms really like Adobe uh, investing in capabilities that make it relevant from a composability perspective is critical. And uh, there's a couple key areas. There's a lot of uh, stuff to unpack on this slide, but I'm not gonna go into everything. So I'll just mention a few key areas. I mean, one of the elements of Mach, the A, is the APIs. And this is an area where Adobe has invested 
over the course of the last two and a half years, significant amount of time and money in really building out a rich GraphQL kind of API framework to interact and extend the platform to enable integrations and other things to be more seamless. This is the same kind of thing that other platforms are doing. You'll see this with Hybris and, and IBM as well. And so the GraphQL layer is really the foundation. In addition to that, they've put together something they call API Mesh on the first slide. And that's really providing some tools in a serverless environment that allows you to not only use APIs that um, are part of the commerce platform, but to leverage APIs that are from the other systems and build out extensible kinds of solutions together using API Mesh. And then the other piece is the App Builder, which is also built on the same uh, serverless backend from Adobe called Adobe IO, which they have some other things running on as well, is really the part of it that allows you to then build applications that have UIs and have workflows and apply to different kinds of business scenarios. So all these different types of capabilities are becoming available. Uh, it's still early, but what's interesting is it really allows people that are leveraging Adobe Commerce to think about their business, not just um, as a, a, an application or a, a, a platform that needs to be integrated in a very customized PHP way, but a more modern way with uh, React front ends and, and things like that, that simplify upgrades as the extensions um, are done or other products get integrated. As long as those other products are integrated, leveraging these new frameworks and not legacy approaches that are bespoke and brittle and have a hard time to um, you know, be simply upgraded. So I think this whole environment is pretty compelling on paper. And I think what's interesting for folks to consider is, you know, what it means for their business. The challenge I see is that Adobe themselves um, aren't in the best position to educate you on that. It's your partners. And so the SIs play a big role in how well Adobe will do in driving adoption uh, of these kind of capabilities and solving some of the bigger problems and extending the life of the platform. So that's what I was excited about this topic today because I think it's 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 um, SIs like ITG and others who are leading the way in thinking about leveraging more of these advanced capabilities to uh, extend, integrate, and make the platform more valuable for our for their customers uh, longer term. Yeah, I think that's that's great, Bill. I think also you know many of these kind of investments and moves that you may want to make as a business are connected to also various different kinds of experiences you want to deliver, different outcomes you're trying to affect and deliver. And and so wiring in an API is just one piece of it. There, there's a number of different aspects that I think, you know, need to be considered. So it, there's a level of complexity here. And as Bill said, you know, the, the partners are in a very good position to help you understand how to use them, if you need to use them, um, and how to incorporate them into the kinds of experiences and, and, and capabilities uh, you're trying to achieve. And I think that leads us really kind of to the next slide where, where I think we want to kind of talk a little bit about how to think about composability uh, in your business. If you're an e-commerce business, you're you're really wondering um, if this is going to be important to you. I think it does relate again to, you know, decisions you may foresee making or not making about your core commerce platform. And I think we're sort of making the assumption that many of you uh, are on Adobe Commerce and Magento and I think, you know, in that context, um, you know, you may really need to see this as a bridge um, that you're going to be on potentially for some time. Now, you don't even necessarily know uh, what the environment's going to be um, as you continue uh, on the platform. But you do know that, you know, reinvesting or replatforming is not necessarily something you see a tremendous amount of business benefit to. Uh, there's not really a core business case right now. Maybe it's even rework. Um, on how you integrate with, with some of the third-party solutions you work with today. Uh, so it doesn't come for free, right? You're increasing and as you move down this composable landscape and you're bringing in even more best-of-breed solutions or replacing 
core parts of the application. Um, obviously, there's more licensing costs to consider, um, as well as adding complexity to the business. And as you become more sophisticated, and you're going to need to adapt both with your own development team and maybe the partners you work with, um, but also how you even operate the business is going to change. So obviously, it doesn't come for free. It's something to be very mindful of. At the same time, you know, we need to recognize that the user experience and the way commerce is done continues to evolve. And while it may feel like it's been pretty consistent, uh, you know, the, the paradigms we were using around our phones and our computers and so on, um, naturally, you know, it's easy to get somewhat complacent um, and think, oh, it's going to be this way for a very long time. I think we have to recognize that the rise of conversational commerce, the growing influence um, of, of third-party platforms like TikTok and so on, and how you may want to think about um, the types of engagement that happen and the kinds of touch points you're going to need to support, not just a chatbot type experience, but maybe you're starting to deliver experiences on a television that before seemed really silly, but now with conversational commerce become actually pretty interesting. Um, maybe that's not today, but it may be very soon. And so I think when you think about composability in your business, it's also about preparing to test into those kinds of, of capabilities, into evolving and expanding the experiences you can deliver, doing that relatively efficiently uh, so that you can afford to test into it. Um, and obviously then having access more efficiently uh, to an ecosystem of best of breed and point solution providers while the core platform uh, is still performing um, some really critical capabilities and in a sense bringing that together um, to enable you to, to, to really act on that. So to me, thinking about it as a long bridge, at some point in time, you may need to move to more of a services-based API-first SaaS solution. That's possible, uh, most certainly. But we may see that this, that this bridge you're on um, may take you quite a ways. Uh, before you then need to change to a boat <laughs> or what have you, and so uh, you know the the the, the current uh, the current capabilities, I think, is certainly something that you're going to want to 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 think about um, the things that, the kind of things that Bill shared, and I think working with a partner is really important to also really recognize where you're at um, as a business and to think through what not just implementation may look like but obviously how you evolve and change um, as a business and how you operate as you move down this, uh, this journey as well. So with that, I wanna thank you all for joining the, the content portion. I hope you get something out of the discussion. Um, and I think we uh, will take some questions cheers. and and then we'll go from there. Cheers. Hey guys, <clears throat> we've got a cheers. We've got a few good questions here, but if you've got any, uh, feel free to, Slide them into the uh, the the Q and A section of, uh, of Zoom here. Um, let's let's start with one off the top here, though. So, do you guys have any opinions on how big or technically proficient a company needs to be to reasonably think about going composable with Magento? So, for example, if I'm a merchant doing maybe like twenty million in online sales with Magento and thinking about like where am I going to end up taking the head off Magento versus just you know going to a, you know, one of the more packaged solutions that's available to owner Shopify or BigCommerce or Shopware or something like that. Like, where, where do you guys think this all fits with the, do we call it smaller end of the market, I think is what this question is pointed at. Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. Well, lots to unpack there. I think, <clears throat> I know Bill will have, have things he wants to chime in here as well, but I'll just take a first swing in. And I think the, um, you know, first of all, if you are operating a relatively straightforward, you know, uh, retail type business and you're direct to consumer and you're really only operating in one geo and you don't have a lot of complexity uh, with your business. Um, naturally, um, you know, you may want to consider something like, like Shopify and so on because, you know, there is a set of core capabilities there and there's a lot of flexibility within like the design aspects of your experience you know, if you're looking to really differentiate, though, in core capabilities or in the experience you want to deliver and don't want to look like you're hosted on, on one of those leading platforms and like every other web experience, or you need to go beyond that, <clears throat> right, and start thinking about a headless strategy um, and many multiple touch points, um, 
or you have other complexity in your business, you'll naturally want to think about both composability, right? Or other alternatives to those, those types of solutions. And if you're on Magento, you know, the advantage is that you have more control. It may not be as simple and straightforward or may not be as cost efficient even, right? As the alternatives, but you have control. And to really in, in improve the amount of control you have naturally, the things we were talking about today, uh, it makes sense. So it's less about the size of the business in my mind, although that's a nice way to think about the market. And as a vendor community, it's very natural to want to segment the market that way, et cetera. It's much more of a sliding scale and it's very hard to, to be super prescriptive about that. At the same time, if you're a hundred million dollar online business or above, right? Naturally, I think you should probably already be moving this way if you're not already. If you're a $50 million, you know, online business, you know, you're, you're getting there. And if you're, if you're smaller than that, you know, you really need to just evaluate the benefits and how you want to differentiate it as a business and what you're trying to accomplish. Or there may be some interesting complexity already there that you can't get. Um, and so I think that's, hopefully that helps. Sounds like kind of a size yeah. complexity ratio is the answer there. Yeah, we'll develop well, an and, algorithm. And with the days. value axis, I mean, the value <laughs> axis is important. And at the end of the day, if there's a business return, do it. She just got a quick, quick comment in the, uh, the, the group here. There was a question also saying that uh, as, as more and more companies do accelerators for the stuff, it'll push it more down market, which I think is a great, great comment. I, I well. agree with you. I agree with you, Noel. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> cheers <laughs> cheers <Noel>. yeah <laughs> question number two uh we've, we've talked about the philosophies of uh going composable and touched on some of the adobe specific technology that can power this um if i'm running my business on magento and thinking about a composable strategy is what about some of the non-adobe things to consider i think what i'm reading in this question is like you know there's some tribalism between people that are on very much on magento and those that are very much bought into the future of adobe and Obviously, we've got you know AEM and some of the front ends to play here, but what what about those that are just looking well, at this from a very I, I, gentle perspective? Again, I know Bill has a lot he wants to say here, but Bill, I want to say something that you know I don't want to put you on the spot with your old Adobe. He wants buddies. to throttle me ahead of time, maybe. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not throttling. I'm saying I'll, I'll say it, but I think you know you want to be careful with any of these large suite uh, players that you're working with. Um, that you're basically all your bat, all your eggs are in one basket. And you're really saying, okay, I'm an all Adobe shop. I'm an all SAP shop. I'm an all Salesforce shop. I think you really need to be very <clears throat> mindful about that. And I know there may be people on this call who will be annoyed that I said that, but this is also why composability matters, right? That you have, you know, that these platforms are enabling you, right? To mix and merge what you need together. Does that mean that arch rivals are going to work on connectors and make it super easy to connect to each other? They should, in my opinion, but they may not. But nonetheless, uh, you may, um, you should be careful with that. While at the same time, recognizing that there's an, you need to really query the, the company that you are working with, in this case, uh, Adobe and Magento, around their ecosystem strategy, right? And are they uh, very actively embracing a third-party ecosystem as well as value add and connectivity to the other Adobe products to enable their customers to take best advantage. So that's, Bill, I know you probably have other things you would add. To no, that. I mean, I mean, you, you always cover them so comprehensively. There's not, there's not too much to add. I mean, the, the interesting thing that I am uh, curious to be mindful of is what Adobe's doing around the data side of the business. And they've actually are creating ways to share data between applications that I think is pretty interesting. I think that they rely on their partners to drive a lot of the integration strategy through these technologies I introduced earlier. They aren't investing a lot themselves in integrating the products, to be honest. They're investing pretty heavily in the AEP platform and sharing data in real time. So I think it's a very different strategy than you'll find from the other uh, platforms. And uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, great, great answers, guys. Um, I, when I, I'll just briefly add to that as well. Like when I think about, you know, the, 
um, the, the composability part of this and, and, you know, the big choices, a lot of it leads to content and, and that's just a, like a segue into the, the November 30th discussion that we're going to have that's going to continue on from here and, and really talk about, uh, you know, a, a bit more of a deeper dive into the content side of, of composable commerce. Um, just in the essence of time, last like a third, third and final question, just uh, a fun and friendly one. Uh, to tell us more about where the Brian and Bill show goes next. You guys have, uh, have oh my gosh. left uh, big, big, big full time jobs and are doing new and exciting things. So what, yeah, what's well, that for you guys here? What, what, a, what a perfect segue, actually, Holly. I think we actually have a slide on this. The maybe, maybe yes, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, it's like the perfect question. Uh, Matt, how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't subscribed to the um, to the newsletter, please do. Um, Bill and I, as, as we said at the top, um, did leave our, our corporate jobs. We're fortunate to be in a position where we get to um, kind of do what we want, which is share our point of view, get back to writing, get back to sharing uh, an industry point of view, doing strategic advisory, which is the strategy M part of the business, and also have a lot of fun sharing our point of view. We share that through our newsletter today. We are in, looking forward to launching other sort of content and, uh, and different products and things that we have in mind, but we're obviously just kind of getting a start. Thank you to ITG for hosting us here today. Thank you to everyone who subscribes to the newsletter. If you don't, we'd love to have you. That picture in the middle is just a little, little snapshot. Great. Thanks guys. Um, yeah. So Thanks, maybe everyone. then just to kind of, just to kind of wrap it up, that's, our contact information here at ITG there and, and just shouting out, you know, we're, this was going to be kind of a two part series We're we're, uh, uh, we're doing another one of these on the 30th of November at the end of the month. And uh, we're going to kind of keep the discussion going from here, from commerce and, and cocktails to commerce and cocktails and content. Uh, got a little more to announce on kind of the, uh, the details of that webinar in the coming weeks, but uh, come, coming back at you with more details and more thoughts around sort of the headless content and CMS side of that for anyone that's running Adobe and Magento Commerce today. So with that, thanks everyone for coming and giving us uh, giving us a bit of time. Great to see all of you. Thanks, Bill and Brian, and we we'll hope to see you all, all again thank soon. You. Thank you, Alex. Cheers. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, thank you, everyone. ITG, and thank you, everyone who joined. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, guys.